tomatoes are vegetables. Now I know what I just said might be controversial, but hear me out. Unlike fruits, which have a very clear botanical definition, being the seed-bearing structures of any flowering plants, the definition of vegetables is much more general, and includes any part of a plant that humans eat. Not only does this mean that fruits are technically included under the term vegetable, but this also includes edible seeds, flowers, leaves, stems, and roots. However, from a culinary perspective, these definitions aren't very useful. On the one hand, plants typically produce fruits so that animals carry them away and eat them, in the process spreading their seeds far and wide. To accomplish this, fruits are typically made soft, sweet, and edible in their raw form. On the other hand, the rest of the plant is not supposed to be eaten, as this actively decreases its chances of reproduction. And therefore, the seeds, flowers, leaves, stems, and roots all come with some form of defense against being eaten, like tough skins, bitter tastes, hard shells, and so on. The only way to make these parts edible is through some form of preparation, be it cooking, baking, boiling, blanching, or whatever. This has led to fruits and all other vegetables having two very different functions in our foods, bringing us back to the tomato. While yes, technically the tomato is the seed-bearing structure of a flowering plant, making it in actuality a fruit, it's pretty rare for people to actually eat them like a fruit. I mean, don't get me wrong, you totally can eat a raw tomato if you want to, nothing bad will happen, except it might taste pretty gross, which is why most people prefer to cook tomatoes as if it were a vegetable, because, well, technically it is. What I'm trying to show you by explaining all of this is that while coming up with a list of fruits to do a geography of video is rather straightforward, doing the same for vegetables isn't as easy, as the term just includes too much. Since I can't go through everything some people either may or may not consider to be vegetables, the only option left for me is to pick and choose only the things I consider to be vegetables, and just suffer the endless comments I'm sure to get telling me everything I missed. So knowing that, let's get started. Being from the United States, my knowledge of vegetables is largely going to reflect foods of European tradition. As such, it only makes sense to start by looking at Europe. If you watched my Geography of Spices video, you know that most foods from Europe had their origin in the highly diverse Mediterranean region, and vegetables are no different. It was here that the wild cardoon first arose with its impressive but spiky flower. What's even crazier is that at some point someone looked at that and said to themselves, I bet I could eat it, and eventually managed to breed it into a more fleshy, less spiky form, giving birth to the modern artichoke. Also belonging to this broadly Mediterranean category is arugula. While today it's mainly the leaves of the plant that we eat, you can also make use of its flowers as well as both its young and fully mature seeds. But be careful, ever since ancient Roman times, arugula was thought to be a strong aphrodisiac, capable of reviving drowsy Venus, whatever that means. It's thought that this is why it started to be mixed with lettuce, as it was thought to have the opposite effect. Ironically, lettuce, which had a huge native range spanning from Europe to Siberia, was first domesticated in ancient Egypt, where it was most closely associated with Min, the god of reproduction, as it was believed to, well, also help with reviving that drowsy Venus. This actually appears to be a trend, with another supposed aphrodisiac from the Mediterranean being asparagus. Though no one really knows why it was so common to associate vegetables with one's ability to uh, canoodle, if I had to hazard a guess, people who ate their vegetables were simply healthier than those who didn't, which makes all sorts of things easier. Aside from making your urine smell worse than it already did, asparagus is also notable for being one of only a few common vegetables where it is the stem of the plant that we mainly eat, with the only other one from the Mediterranean being celery. Though this only partially counts, not only because the leaves and seeds of celery are also used to make spices, but it was also only around the 1950s that we finally figured out a way to get people to eat celery by making it into ants on a log. It was also in this region that peas first emerged, though these come in two main varieties, classic green peas as well as yellow peas. And if you've ever taken a biology class, you'll probably know that it was by breeding yellow and green peas together that Gregor Mendel first came to understand patterns of inheritance, observing the yellow trait to be dominant and the green trait to be recessive. 
What this means is that green peas have actually been purposefully bred this way, I guess revealing our preference for green above yellow. While technically a whole pea pod qualifies as a fruit, individual peas are seeds, meaning we've covered all the major vegetable groups except for roots. These are tricky, because a lot of the time, people don't start by eating a plant's roots, you know, the only part that comes buried in the ground and covered in dirt. Instead, root vegetables tend to be first grown for some other edible aspect of the plant, and only after some time do farmers realize that the root is edible as well. This is exactly what happened with beets, which were initially grown throughout the Mediterranean for their leaves, which today we'd call chard. It was only after this that the plant's roots were noticed for their size and their ability to be eaten. The story is the same for turnips, where it was in northern Europe that they were again first harvested for their leaves, before people realized that their large taproot was edible as well. But okay, it's at this point that I need to bring up the true MVP of European vegetables, Brassica olericea, otherwise known as wild cabbage. In its wild form, the plant makes use of its high salt tolerance to grow along the coastlines of south and western Europe, where few other plants can inhabit. Given its wide natural distribution, a number of different people groups would come to encounter and cultivate their own forms of brassica. The most obvious is of course cabbage, which was selectively bred for its large edible leaves and the dense head that it forms in the first year of being planted. Eventually, however, the people living in southern Italy and Sicily began to prefer the edible flowers that brassica grew, and over time developed their own cultivar we now know as broccoli. A very similar thing happened on the island of Cyprus, where it was again the flowering head of the plant that was selectively bred, resulting in broccoli's better tasting pale twin, cauliflower. From here, cauliflower went on its very own journey, first being bred back into a green variant known as broccoflower. By the 16th century, this green variant made it back to Italy, where further breeding led its flower to develop into a fractal pattern, resulting in what we'd call Romanesco cauliflower, which might win the prize for the craziest looking vegetable in existence. 300 years after that, in 1970, a new mutation in cauliflower was first noticed in Ontario, Canada, which led to the plant developing a yellowish color. Seeds of this initial mutant were sent to Geneva, New York, where the New York State Agricultural Experimentation Station is located. And after a few years of crossing and recrossing this variant with regular cauliflower, a new cultivar containing 25% more beta-carotene was produced, turning the vegetable orange in the process. This only opened the door for even more experimentation, and not long afterward the purple cauliflower was produced, altogether making the cauliflower family surprisingly colorful. But okay, back to brassica. Roman farmers again started to play around with the genetics, experimenting with shrinking the cabbage head. As Roman armies expanded across Europe, so too did their crops, and this is how a small variant of cabbage made it all the way to Belgium, where it was further bred until a new kind of cabbage was cultivated, which grew many small heads on a tall stock. Because these tiny cabbages were closely associated with Belgium, and specifically the city of Brussels, everyone in Europe began calling them, you guessed it, Brussels sprouts. The ancient Greeks had the opposite idea, choosing instead to focus on growing out the plant's leaves without a head, resulting in the cultivation of both kale and collard greens. Altogether, 13 different vegetables have been produced through the Brassica olericea plant. However, food is one of those things that humans just can't get enough of, and so, despite what plants started out on the continent, Europeans historically imported food from all over the world. But with Europe contained by the Sahara to the south, the Atlantic to the west, and the Arctic to the north, for most of history the only route for new foods to be introduced to the continent was through the Middle East. Not only did this mean most foods introduced first had to be introduced here, but also foods originating from this region had the greatest chances of being introduced to Europe. Which is why this is where we'll find the second biggest area of origin for popular vegetables. Starting off strong, it's thought that carrots got their start in Afghanistan, as this is where the diversity of wild carrots reaches its peak. Here, carrots started off as white and purple, which, as we can see from beets and turnips, tends to be the most common colors for tap roots. And it stayed like this for some time, as just like with other root veggies, carrots were first cultivated for their leaves and seeds. But eventually, in what was then Persia, but is now parts of Iran and Afghanistan, people began cultivating carrots for their edible root. 
Pretty soon afterwards, people started to notice a common mutation that would leave the root without anthocyanin, the purple pigment, resulting in a more yellowish carrot due to the small amount of beta-carotene stored in the root. Like this, carrots made their way into Europe, where farmers continued to breed even more varieties like red and yes, eventually orange carrots, creating a wide spectrum of carrot colors to choose from. Why it was the orange carrot that eventually ended up as everyone's go-to carrot color isn't really understood. I mean, sure, some people like to tell the story about how it was farmers from the Netherlands who grew orange carrots out of some immense sense of patriotism, but that's really nothing more than some crazy story historians came up with to explain what was more likely just a bunch of people doing something for no particular reason. For all we know, it simply could have been the fact that most other root vegetables are either white or purple, and the stark orange color helped the carrot to differentiate itself from all other veggies. Okay, but enough about carrots. They aren't the only top-tier vegetable to come out of this region, as it's thought that onions also originated here. Since their domestication, wild onions have actually gone extinct, making it hard to trace their exact area of origin, and the best we can do is to say they came from Central Asia an area spanning from Iran all the way to the top of India, roughly corresponding with the Achaemenid Empire. It was likely the stability brought about by this empire that allowed agriculture to not only prosper but actually advance, as it was also here that spinach is believed to have been first domesticated. However, because the Achaemenids earned a number of enemies amongst their European neighbors, Persian inventions often had to take another route into Europe. For spinach, it wasn't until the Umayyad conquests that a trade network moving through North Africa all the way to southern Spain was established, allowing the crop to spread from here to the rest of Europe. Sometimes, however, a plant would be valuable enough to the point where demand caused traders to bring it directly into Europe. This is what happened with rhubarb. Originating somewhere within Central Asia, it was actually the ancient Chinese who first began using the plant, except they weren't eating it as a vegetable, but rather using rhubarb roots as a medicine, specifically as a laxative. It's important to note that back then, laxatives were a much bigger part of medicine, as it was seen as a way to purge your entire system. Over time, this practice spread first to the Middle East and eventually to Europe, where its supposed medicinal properties earned it a higher price than even in-demand spices like cinnamon and saffron. The earliest known record of rhubarb being consumed as a food only comes from around the 1800s, where people in Britain started using rhubarb stems in desserts and for sweetening wine. A similar route must have been taken by the radish. While essentially no archaeological evidence exists for us to use to determine its region of origin, the only known forms of wild radishes can be found growing in Southeast Asia. With the earliest historical records of radishes coming from Greek and Roman farmers in the first century CE, this suggests that these veggies must have made the several thousand mile journey long before anything like the Silk Road had developed. Now, something you may have noticed is that so far, China has been largely left out of the conversation. Despite my efforts to figure out why, well, I couldn't. I mean, it's not like there wasn't a large number of vegetables that originated here. There was, and even something similar to the diversification of Brassica oleracea happened here, where it was Brassica rapa that was cultivated into, among other things, bok choy, komatsuna, mizuna, choy sum, and Chinese cabbage. Beyond this, soybeans can also trace their origins here. However, with the exception of soybeans, none of these vegetables really reached far outside of East Asia. My theory is that because for most of human history China isolated itself from the rest of the world, the unique vegetables bred here were never really spread beyond their point of origin. The same can be said for most vegetables originating in sub-Saharan Africa, like African nightshade, okra, jute mallow, and cow peas. Because contact between this part of the world and Europe was pretty limited for most of human history, these vegetables never made their way into Western cuisine. However, if the vegetables are good enough, they can overcome isolation, which is exactly what happened with a number of crops originating in the Americas. Just like how the Mediterranean was the center of crop cultivation for Europe, Central America played an analogous role for the New World, making it the third and final major source of common vegetables. Most popular among them is probably corn or maize. Having been domesticated from the wild teosinte plant some 9,000 years ago, corn quickly became a staple crop for many indigenous people, 
While the arrival of Europeans may have been detrimental for the people of the Americas, as far as corn was concerned, this was the best thing that ever could have happened to it. Production of corn skyrocketed at this point, surpassing both wheat and rice in terms of total production quantity, to become the most farmed grain in the world and the second most farmed crop overall, only beaten out by sugarcane. Due to corn's key position within global agriculture, a lot of research has gone into the plant's genetics, both in order to manipulate them but also to understand where it came from, and by extension to know the best environmental conditions for it. This is how we know that it was specifically the Balsas River Valley in southern Mexico where corn was first domesticated. Together with beans and squash, corn formed what was known as the Three Sisters, considered to be the three most important crops by many Native Americans, all of which having originated in close proximity to one another in Central America. Squash are technically fruits, meaning I already covered them in a previous video, and so I'll skip talking about them here. Beans, however, deserve their story being told. What we're talking about here is known as the common bean, Fasciolus vulgaris, and similar to the brassica crops, as populations of people spread across the Americas, they took their beans with them, often breeding their very own unique variety out of a single species. It would be out of this common bean that cultivars like black beans, kidney beans, navy beans, pinto beans, cranberry beans, and yes, even green beans were bred. Besides the three sister crops and all their variants, Central America also produced the sweet potato. While these may not have been as important to Native American peoples, as Europeans began to explore the Pacific Ocean, they found many Pacific Islanders had come to rely on the sweet potato as their staple crop. What this appears to suggest is the people of the Pacific must have come into contact with people from the Americas, hundreds, possibly thousands of years before Columbus. Last but certainly not least, we must leave Central America and look a little further south, across what's modern day Peru and Bolivia, where perhaps the world's best vegetable was first cultivated, the potato. First domesticated within the Andes by the Inca, similar to beans, as the potato spread outward from here, farmers developed it into a number of varieties, producing potatoes of virtually every color, shape, and size. However, when the Spanish arrived and decided they liked them, they only took a small selection back with them to Europe, meaning the genetic diversity of what would eventually become the European potato crop was nowhere near that of the American potato. This low genetic diversity made potatoes particularly vulnerable to disease in Europe, paving the way for events like the Irish potato famine to occur. Overall, however, this did little to dissuade Europeans from integrating new world crops into their diets. What never ceases to amaze me when making these geography of food videos is just how diverse our food really is, to the point where something as American as corn ends up being from Mexico. Something as British as baked beans originated as a Native American dish. And even something as Chinese as stir-fry sources veggies everywhere from the Middle East to Europe all the way to the Americas. Ultimately, what videos like this reveal is just how interconnected our world is and always has been, and where things come from isn't nearly as important as what you do with them. Hey everyone, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Ever since I started this Geography of Food series, I've gotten comments on literally every video of mine asking specifically for this one, so I hope you're satisfied. Of course, let me know all the vegetables I missed in the comments, and also what else you'd like to see the geography of, now that I've covered all the major food groups. Lastly, I couldn't do this without the support of my patrons, so if you'd like to help support this channel, there should be a link on screen that'll take you on over to my Patreon. Besides that, like, subscribe, and check out this playlist of my geography of videos if you want more. Thanks!